This is the Untamed Ethos Podcast. Join us as investment pros, executives, and other experts talk business, personal growth, investing, politics, and the trending topics well-rounded pros need to know about. Authentic, unfiltered, and fun. Joshua Wilson is the founder of United Ethos Wealth Partners, a registered investment advisor. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of United Ethos's investment advice on this podcast, and nothing you'll hear on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. All opinions expressed by Joshua and by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of United Ethos or its affiliates. Welcome back to Untamed Ethos. I am Joshua Wilson, and with me is Dr. Vix. Russell Rhodes. Uh, today, I, had my, sorry, I had my mute button on there, but hi, Josh. Hi. <laughs> so, welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, I've got a few things in mind. I've got a few uh, few questions for for Doctor Vix on on the Vix and some uh, some volatility related questions. Um, got some thoughts on Twitter scams, our problems with influencers. Um, index exposure. Uh, we, talk, we were talking about it, a few ways to get index exposure earlier, so we'll, we'll probably get into that today. And also some just reflections of working with the next generation in uh, in academia. You know, as as many, many of you know, um, I've been teaching for several semesters at uh, at Baylor Hankamer School of Business, and Russell uh, is and has been continues to teach at Kelly School of Business at Indiana University, and. Uh, both high quality students uh, in both in both places, but um, you know I think we both have some thoughts on talking to the next generation and kind of how schooling has changed and um, you know maybe some of the struggles with it that that we're dealing with as as both professors and going into the workplace. Which again we're we're both crossovers. We're both uh, we're both professors mm-hmm. plus 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 practitioners as well. So. Um, Russell, let's let's kick off today with a little bit of market talk. One of the things that I had um, I'd seen the other day was that it looked to me like open interest in VIX calls is about as high as I'd seen it since in, in about five years. I think it was since since uh, early, let's see, late 2017, early 2018. And is that because of the VIX level or why, why are we seeing all the extra open interest? Well, it's it's the it, it, it's a function of the way that peop, that hedgers and when I say hedgers, I don't mean volatility hedgers. I mean uh, people trying to hedge their stock market exposure. It one of the one of the uses of VIX is to get some long exposure, and uh, typically being long volatility is a losing prospect unless you get some sort of event. And the the use of um, you know, the use of VIX calls, it, it increases when VIX is at lower levels. You know, VIX uh, and volatility is a range bound measure. Now, the range for VIX is between nine and like 82 or 83. But um, when VIX gets into the, the teens, uh, buying a call option on VIX is more attractive than when, when VIX is spending its time in the mid 20s, where it spent most of uh, last year, most of 2022. So w- one of the and, and I've seen something that that kind of reinforces what we're talking about right now. You saw the open interest on the VIX calls and the overall open interest on, in the VIX complex is just under 14 million contracts. Uh, I, I remember when it was like one in two. Uh, so it's uh, definitely taken off to the upside, but it was uh, a record high as of late last week, and which was May 12th. Uh, the the use of VIX calls increases when VIX is at lower levels. And with VIX in the 15, 16, 17 range, uh, we've seen increased buying and call options. And when you see increased demand for options, that pushes implied volatility up. So right. there hasn't been as much b- demand for SPX options, which has allowed VIX to drift to a lower level. But with VIX at a lower level, that's increasing interest in buying VIX calls for some sort of tail hedge. And that buying has also shown up in a volatility index or VVIX, yeah. which is the VIX of VIX. Uh, last week, VIX was down slightly and VVIX was actually up. And uh, that was because, and, and I did see a couple of uh, really large trades that were buying VIX calls last week. Well, that that demand pushes VVIX up and it really is a response to uh, VIX moving to lower levels. Do you, do you see that um, does the SPX calls in this situation ever 
feel like it deviates from what you're seeing in the VIX? Because obviously the SPX is your first level derivative and the, the, the VIX is a second level derivative that's based mm -hmm. off of a derivative price. So just to back up for some of our listeners that may be less familiar with this, the VIX is based off of the price of the spectrum of calls and puts. And there's a, um, an algorithm that goes with this, a calculation, how the VIX is calculated. But it's ca calculated based off of the implied volatilities of the calls and puts um, on the SPX. So the SP, the SP, SP 500. So then the VIX itself, there's also derivatives on the VIX. So the VIX itself is just an index. It's just a figure that's based mm -hmm. on the SPX. And that is, and the reason that's so is because as the price of the option contracts on the SPX goes up, remember, Options are really, you can think of them as insurance contracts on stocks mm -hmm. or on indexes. So if, if, insurance, if the price of insurance is going up, in other words, it's more expensive to buy insurance on an index or on a stock, that tells you something about mm -hmm. how people feel about that index or about that stock. Um, I give the example often of flood insurance. If the, if the, if the water is already at your door, the price is going to be higher than it would have been if you'd have bought it when, when it was sunny outside, right? So mm -hmm. the, the VIX is just a figure based on these options prices of the SPX. But then the VIX also has its own derivatives, its, its own, uh, its own futures, its own, its own, its own options as well. So you can trade those, those as well based on what you think the VIX is going to do. So that's a mm -hmm. second order derivative. It's based off of, off of a, a, a price of this based off derivatives of the SPX. And then you've got the, the, the next level of, of, of VIX. So when you're, when you're talking about these options, again, I just want to specify that we're not talking about options on the SPX. We're talking mm -hmm. about options on the VIX. Correct. So Correct. Do you okay. see, do you see those, depart at times between buying more calls on the SPX as a uh, as a hedge versus going directly to the second order? You mean buying calls on SPX for a hedge? I mean, you could, right? Uh, maybe, well, I if guess you're buy, short the S&P 500. That's right. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm in, inverted there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that'd no, be an interesting it's, hedge, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it's a, a, we, we, a hedge against right markets crashing up. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, it, it, it's kind of funny that you bring up the call thing. Um, it, I, I haven't, we haven't seen it in VIX really, but there is a Russell 2000 volatility index, which of course is my favorite one. And um, la a, a couple of years ago, when we had the meme stock stuff going on yeah. and the Russell 2000 was going ballistic to the upside, you actually could see the Russell 2000 VIX being driven by call buying on the Russell on the small cap index uh, as kind of a FOMO trade. Wow! Uh, believe it or not, so there it, it, I haven't really seen that occur in it, it, with the SPX complex because everybody's usually naturally long. Uh, large cap type stocks. But if you're trying to get long small cap stocks, usually you want to use an ETF instead of picking individual stocks. You may want to use an ETF or derivatives based on the Russell 2000. So the when we have seen a melt up and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Russell 2000 underperformed the S&P. In 2020, the Russell 2000 underperformed the um, S&P 500. And as of about this time, and then uh, started to play some catch up. And in 2020, the Russell 2000 was up almost 54% from its lows. And during that time period, the Russell 2000 volatility index was at a much higher level relative to VIX than you would expect. And when you started to take a look at the option activity, it was fear of missing out small cap players that were uh, buying call options on the Russell 2000. So it is possible that call activity can influence volatility indexes, but it's it's been shown in in multiple ways that for VIX, it really is the S and P five hundred put option activity that drives VIX. And I think VIX moving lower with VVIX moving higher, which is something that happened last week, was an instance where uh, you've got this either or decision. 
If I want to hedge against some sort of uh, drop in the S&P 500, do I want to buy puts on the S&P 500 or do I want to buy calls on VIX? And the, uh, the decision seems to be leaning more toward buying VIX calls these days than buying S&P 500 puts. Hmm. Yeah, and, and thinking about how those actually contribute to the price of VIX. I mean, you know, this came up in, in my dissertation, which you which you're aware of when we when we reproduced uh, replicated the VIX in order to do the study, and the coefficient for um, the ten percent out of the money call was actually negative. It wasn't huge, yep. but it was negative. But it it was like it basically was you know if we. If we were doing, if we were just doing the correlation there, it would basically the out of the money call options had no influence on VIX. Yeah, in fact, almost right. a little bit of a little little bit of, a little bit slightly, negative. Well, slightly negative because what's happening is when um, when the S and P five hundred starts to sell off, and <clears throat> there's some panicked buying of SPX puts, uh, that actually could start that that actually can result in. Uh, a little downward pressure on uh, S&P 500 calls, either because uh, traders do like to try to find ways to pay for buying that protection. And one, ways, one way to pay for that protection is maybe sell some other calls. Money calls. And that, I, I think that was the behavior that, that mm -hmm. results in that, in out of the money calls, really not having a relationship with VIX. Yeah, that's there. Yeah, I, I didn't even really think I didn't even extend it my thought to the to the callers. <laughs> I'm just thinking I I've calls. spent too much time thinking about Vic since I spent a decade at SIBO and <laughs> and then continue to. So yeah, oh, you're winding, you're, I'm like a wind up toy, man. You're getting me going on <laughs> Good, good. You gotta you gotta, you gotta stop me or that, that'll be the hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we, we try to keep this this podcast uh uh some ing some some ingredient of nerdery and then some yeah. ingredient of approachability to kind of keep it fun and and approachable. So uh, we'll we'll try to lean lean away there. But before we talk about some some fun stuff, um, yeah, that that makes me think about exposure to indexes, and that's a conversation you and I've had before too. Is um, you know different ways to get exposure to indexes in a in a volatile environment. Um, you know, obviously you can build your own portfolio, you can buy an ETF, you can buy a mutual fund, um, mm -hmm. you can go, you know, go directly into the, um, you know, the options and so forth. But what else can you do if you want to get exposure to an index that's maybe, especially one, especially an index that's maybe not so, um, not so vanilla, like an S&P 500, or, you know, maybe we're talking about a foreign index or something like that. How, how else can we get exposure? Um, I, typically, I, I, I I'll start with foreign indexes because I've got like a, a long term macro position where I, I think China's going to get hurt and Vietnam and India are going to pick up the slack there. So I found uh, pretty good, pretty good ETFs, one that's basically an inter inverse China ETF. And then I matched it up dollar for dollar with uh, half long Vietnam and half uh, long India, which makes things a lot easier back back when I started. If I wanted to do a trade like that, um, I probably would have to go to an investment bank and they would enter into an over-the-counter trade with me where I could be right and still lose money because the darn thing would be so expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, that's one of the great things about ETFs is that it allows you, if you've got some sort of you know macro outlook, there's there's an ETF for that. Uh, in fact, I, I wouldn't be surprised. If, if I could create an ETF, I probably would create one right now that gives you long, you know, Long Vietnam, short China or something like that, just to see how that trade works out. Uh, one of the ETF companies uh, a while back did a long online retail, short brick and mortar retail, which worked out particularly well. Uh, and the whole idea was it was just a, a, a single trade. Uh, if you want to get exposure to indexes in the U.S., whether it's long or short, there's great ETFs for that. I guess I'm kind of old school. I still trade uh, the futures when I want exposure to the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, or the Russell 2000. Um, over the weekend, I, I, I took a look at uh, SPX versus the Russell 2000. SBN 500 has really outperformed the Russell 2000 lately. Uh, that tends to reverse itself over time. 
and I'm exploring different ways to go about impl implementing a trade around that one right now. Uh, the simplest one is really the, uh, you know, go long the futures in one and go short the futures in another and try to match them up dollar for dollar. Uh, the one S&P future is 2.3 times one Russell future right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm either going to be a little bit long or a little bit short, probably a little bit long. Uh, I think I would probably do three Russell futures to each S&P 500 future. Uh, and then, you know, for shorter term stuff, uh, these days, the way every everybody's favorite way to get index exposure is those, uh, you know, index options that expire every single day. We've got, yeah. as we sit here on a Monday, we've got S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 index options that ex expire, I think, every day for the next two weeks. So if you if, if you think we're going to be higher by next Wednesday, but then lower by next Friday, you could put a trade on around that. Uh, sounds pretty specific. You're definitely threading the needle there. Um, but there's there's just about every way, shape and form that you can get exposure to all these markets in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Does that do you have any concerns with with the with the foreign ETFs? I mean, there, you always hear so much about, you know, um, how are they put together or what's actually in them or, you know, a lot of folks prefer. Uh, active versus passive, um, and, and, and I'm not an expert on this, so I'm I'm just uh -huh. I'm just parroting what I hear. Um, but they, you know, some will say prefer indexes because I don't trust any of them, and mm -hmm. <laughs> some will say prefer active because who knows what's in the index. And some say, well, no, how how can we know about any of them? And certain place like in a place like China, so you're it, it's all it's all. Um, sorry, my dog's having a, a fit over here. She's in the floor somehow snorting out if you hear that. <laughs> um, but anyway, she, she's not happy with what I'm, what I'm saying. She's got something to say. She's, she's not happy with the 40 ETF uh, yeah. conversation. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the thing I always do, I do check what index the ETFs are based on. Uh, and if, if, if it's an active ETF, which I just completely shy away from active ETFs, I, I like to know what I've got and I like to know what I've got in the ETF relative to um, what I'm, you know, what I'm doing in my personal account at the same time. You know, I don't want to own an active ETF and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody at all, but I don't want to own an active ETF. And, uh, you know, I've got a very negative opinion on Tesla, for instance. Hmm. And all of a sudden one day, you know, you don't find out till the next day. All of a sudden, we find out that you know this active ETF is loaded up long on Tesla. Um, if I've got an active ETF that's systematically oriented, like one that has a consistent strategy, I'm okay with that. But the ones that are 100% discretionary, I just I I, I you know I, I want to know what I own, and you're not going to know what you own with with those types of uh, with those types of products. Out yeah, there. I, 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 I would say that. I would, I, my opinion would be a little more nuanced than that. Mm. And it would be because yes, if I'm, if I'm trading and I'm, I'm attending this for a short term trade or for intermediate term trade, and that's going to throw me off big time. If obviously I would not want a ETF that was that level of active. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, that binary of active versus passive is, probably not specific enough for the conversation that we're having i would say you know you call it full discretionary and and when i say full discretionary the the ability to truly be you know more like an more like a mutual fund or an sma right right um, whereas if you are active but more along um a discipline methodology that i understand that i understand that well i'm not worried about this specific etf that they're going to load up on Tesla because I understand the the criteria that they're that they're investing on. So I would say that yeah, if I'm if I'm trading like that, I'm probably going to prefer something that's more passive, that's more index based, that I, that that that's, uh, that's going to be uh, very consistent. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm um, building a portfolio and it's something that I'm thinking about more like rebalancing once a year, or once a quarter, or something like that. I'm probably I, I like e active ETFs quite a bit, and when I say like, um, doesn't mean all of them. <laughs> uh, doesn't doesn't mean any any one specific thing. But I would say that I 
I like them for different reasons. And it's kind of like if someone asks me, you know, what kind of car should I buy? What kind of automobile should I buy? And I'm not going to say you should buy this or that this. I'm going to ask you a few more questions. And I mm-hmm. think that's how I would take take the portfolio management conversation on something like this is, well, let's talk. Let's talk more because an active ETF may be great for you. A very active ETF may be per- appropriate for some investors um, or portfolio managers. Whereas in another situation, I could see is this is inappropriate for you because of what you're trying to accomplish. And mm-hmm. this is not the best way to accomplish it. Just like, you know, I, I drive a truck um, in general, but... You know, um, I live, you know, 30 minutes from Dallas. And when I go into Dallas, I don't love my truck, but I sure love <laughs> the truck in the suburbs and you yeah. know, the other place I, I go. Know. But I recognize it's not the best vehicle for when I'm in Dallas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally I, I totally know what you mean behind behind that one. I just I I, I yeah, the, I think there there's some great active ETFs that you know, we'll sell, consistently sell call options, a covered call ETF. There's several of those, yeah. um, which, you know, if you're mildly bullish, uh, make an awful lot of sense. But you know exactly what they're what they're going to be doing, you know, when they're going to re- rebalance and you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to have from month to month. Um, you know, the headline that uh, somebody, you know, named Kathy is loading up on Tesla again and you find out in the evening that they've been doing that. Uh, that that's that's something I'm I just really want to avoid. Yeah, I I, I think when we when we get into this stuff about options ETFs as well, and and you know it's it's been a while since I was the CIO and I was actually you know doing this you know, getting really really into the weeds with these things, but I, I tended to have the problem that I felt like a lot of funds that I looked to, especially like ETFs that were trying to it was there was not enough manager discretion for me to feel comfortable doing it. And what I mean by that is I felt like that when it comes to options trading, I think of it more as here's my tool belt. Here's the type of trades that I make and I will make different trades depending on market conditions. And when you tell me you're doing a, you know, iron condor, strategy. That's what we do. Or we do a covered call strategy. That's what we do. It's like you're forcing that onto the market. You know, it's like me saying, you know, I'm going to drive a convertible because I get the best view and I can see so well and enjoy the. Well, I'm going to drive a convertible no matter what, no matter mm-hmm. what I'm going to drive, I'm going I'm to have the top down, like no matter what the conditions are like on the road and the, in the weather. And, um, you know, and like I said, I'm, I'm not aware of some of the newer funds and things, but that was that's a problem I've had in the past with many funds is it was just too. Um, I felt like we got to the point where we we're forcing things on the market. And why would I want to sell a covered call for three cents? You know, just because, you know, well, volatility is so low and I'm like that's not worth my time. It's not worth the effort. I'm, I'm going to get I'm not getting I'm not getting paid to transfer mm-hmm. this risk because, you know, when I think of options and, you know, I, you know I've debated this a little bit and um I know that you you think my definition may be a little oversimplistic, but I'm trying to keep it very, very simple, um, is I like to say that with options, there's only three basic things you can do with options. You mm-hmm. can add risk, you can remove risk, and that means up to taking it all away, right? Yeah. Add, add, you can add infinite risk or little risk. You can remove a little risk or all risk, or you can just transform risk. Right, you mm-hmm. change the, the the characteristics of the risk profile, and to me, a covered call trade is just a transformation of risk. Right, it's just you're just changing yeah. the risk profile. You're taking some income right now, and you're taking taking something off the table and adding some you know, take, tr- trading some of your upside for for a guarantee of short term income. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and with um, and with a covered call strategy, it's like well. Five a nickel doesn't get me. It doesn't really help me much. I'm giving up a lot of upside for a nickel. Like I'm, I'm nickel mm-hmm. doesn't move it. But if that's what the what, what the rules say, well, I'm 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 if it's in my portfolio, I'm saying screw the rule. I'm not selling a call this month, mm-hmm. or this week, or I'm waiting till next week. I'm waiting to see, and maybe I can't generate anything with calls, or I've got to just go or to, or 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 to meet a mandate of generating a certain amount of premium, which. And maybe the portfolio managers don't tend, don't don't intend for this to be, but I see a lot of salesmen 
over the over the years saying, you know, we'll get you another five percent, we'll get you another seven percent, we'll get you another three, whatever it is. And so they, mm-hmm. you know, it forces these managers to, I think, sometimes, I, I think it. It, it sets them up to underperform because the expectation is is based on a percentage and something that's easy to put in your head, like, hey, another six percent a year, it's another half percent a month. Dude, never yeah. tell never set expectations. This just grinds my gears. People talking about about um about setting expectations on options portfolios and saying something as asinine as well, it's like a half percent a month. Yeah. Oh, That's I've seen that. I've totally seen that. Work. You're going to get them, except when, except when you give up a whole lot of the upside. Exactly. You know, well, well that's the thing is, yeah. if, 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 if volatility is not cooperating, uh, especially with the call options, um, and there we went through a time, there's just a, you know, an excessive amount of call options really being sold. Um, but, you know, you've got to, in order to generate any sort of income in a certain environment, you'll have to go super close to the money. Well, then yeah. one little pop and you, your stock's lost. Or you're now you're trying to play catch up because you're trying to sell up and out, you know, to 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 roll that option forward and you know, so you're not losing money. And so yeah, these these mandates of selling option strategies as if they are coupons, that's kind of how it sounds to me. When you're telling someone six percent a year, that's kind of like half percent a month and these types of things, it just Grinds my gears. It keeps people oh, yeah. from ha- from forming proper expectations, and then gets people negative on options and begin with. When really, at reality, I get it. Everyone wants a simple, simple, simple explanation, but options aren't that simple. You know, they're no. they're simple. I can make them as simple as possible until we have to actually execute on them, and, and, and we got to get into the nuance of why we can. You know, um, it's, you know, we have the same issue talking about stocks. Sometimes when you talk about oh, stock market does you know seven percent a year, eight percent a year, ten percent a year. It almost never returns ten percent. No, <laughs> it's and just, no, it it's never, just yeah. a long term average. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just, uh, yeah, I just finished up teaching undergrad investments, and um, you know that that was a big point that you know I I tried to make was you know we say the average risk premium is this number we have we never hit that number. Yeah, you know we're always a little bit above and a little bit above below, but those numbers average out in the long run to to give us. Uh, that number for sure. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of speaking of this, or do you have do you have another comment on that? No, I know we're going to talk about students now. Bump up. Yeah. <laughs> so I was helping you segue to students. So yeah. So, so now, you know, now that now that class is out, we can talk about them. Now that now that class is out, um, you know, I I, well, I I got I was thinking about this, Russell, because. You know, the students we have, and we both have taught undergrads and grads, and I think you're moving exclusively to grads pretty soon. Yeah. Um, but that's that's who we're all going to be dealing with next. That's who, you know, I mm-hmm. I try I think of myself as a young guy. I'm 40, but, um, you know, everything I grew up with is, is oldies to these kids. So I'm really not that young. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it's been over. You know, it's been twenty years almost since I've since I've been their age. You know, um, and so I think about how how do we relate to them and what are they going through and how do we talk and you know my reflection of what I've seen and I and I'm not the first to say this by any means mm-hmm. is I feel like there's an aversion to thinking and critical thought. Yes, it's, <laughs> I feel, and, and again, let me, let me hedge this real quick. Not everyone. And there are amazing students that surprise me and are smarter than I expect and are more thoughtful than I expect. And that every class has those. I would say the average, the mean, however, is, and of course, then the lower end especially, is averse to thinking. And that's a good way to put it. Yep. I would say that it's, and I don't know if it, if it's because I mean, you can say it's because of laziness or because of entitlement or because of blah blah all this crap. Maybe it's because mm-hmm. of, of of polarity in the world because everything is it, it's it's wrong to debate so many things. You can't actually talk about it because it's right or wrong. And mm-hmm. you know this is wrong and this is how it is and these people are bad. 
And I feel like that that kind of attitude comes into the classroom where I don't just want you to repeat the answer to me. I want you to understand why the answer exists and how to get to the answer. So when someone tells you something and claims it's a fact, you are you know how to go figure out if it is a fact and not mm-hmm. and based on something besides just how does it make me feel? Does it <laughs> does it feel um, according to my worldview? Does it feel like does it feel like my church? Does it feel like my social group? Does it feel like when I'm what my professor tells me? Does it feel like what I see on TikTok? And I say all these examples because this is not just a uh, a left wing um, no uh, bio. No. Like it's not just something that I feel like is just happening on the left wing. I feel mm-hmm. like that's um, that we we're looking to classify something, um, whether it's good or bad, before we think about why. Yeah, and then you automatically anchor your your thinking into it being good or bad. Um, I got a prime example. I just I, when I was at uh, when I was at Loyola and teaching, uh, where which is where Loyola Chicago, where I was before Indiana, um, I was teaching corporate finance, and I uh, I talked about uh, you know issuing bonds because it lowers your tax liability. And this kid raises his hand and he said, you know. It, it, Companies trying not to pay taxes, that, that's doing harm. And remember, in this day and age, the, uh, you know, when I was in college, public companies existed to increase shareholder value. And now it's increase shareholder value and do no harm. And this kid was convinced that lowering your tax bill was doing harm. That, that, that companies should be giving that as much money as they possibly can to the government because the government does so much good with the money uh, relative to money that might be uh, returned to investors through bond coupon payments or through, uh, through dividends or, you know, or just whatever. And dividends don't really decrease taxes, but he was just adamant that companies should not em- embark upon things that lower their tax bill. Because that's doing harm to society, and and I just I, I, I just that that one just continue, and that's been like five or six years, and that one continues to just absolutely blow me away. Yeah. Um, why do you? Yeah, why do you think that um, you know paying what you're supposed to pay according to the letter of the law in taxes is a negative thing? Yeah, I'm not talking about you know you know doing things that the IRS shows up at your house and, um, you know, questions you about uh, some of the uh, the write-offs that you're taking and things like that. I'm just talking about the normal rules that you operate within for doing business. And one of the things is bond coupon interest is considered an operating expense. Operating expenses go against revenues to reduce your profits or before tax profits. And that results in lower tax bills for for large companies. But even if they're, you know, if, if they're not paying, you know, if, if they're saving something on taxes, that money's being returned to individuals. They're doing things with that money. It's probably getting taxed at that level. Uh, large companies employ a lot of people. Uh, there are a ton of income taxes that get paid as well. Uh, they're, they're paying plenty of taxes in plenty of different places. And they're probably able to employ a few more people if they uh, are paying a bit less of their revenues and taxes every year. So I just I, I couldn't wrap my head around uh, his thinking with respect to, uh, you know, issuing bonds to lower your tax liability and returning more money to investors, that being a company doing harm. So that that, you know, and he probably already had a negative. And why in the world he was in a finance class? I don't know, because he definitely had a very negative attitude about business. Yeah, I mean, the, the it's funny because, you know, I would. I would look at this in a very practical way and say there are rules to this game that we play and, and oh it's not a game okay whatever like no I don't I don't yeah. care what you want to call it there are rules to this thing that we do called business there are rules to and business well I don't care if you're an employee or an employer or a, a sole proprietor whatever you are there are rules and mm-hmm. it is to your advantage to learn the rules and 
knowing the rules and applying the rules is not neither good nor bad. Um, it, that's not up for the business person to decide. It's, well, hey, the government says they will give me a, 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 a tax deduction for edu- you know, for education. Okay, well, why is that? Well, because they want to incentivize you to get to, to go to college or to get more mm-hmm. education or whatever. It's a system of incentives and disincentives. So if they are incentivizing something, then that means they want more of it. And yeah, debt um, increases the money supply, which they like. It's more money working. Mm-hmm. So it's actually an incentive to take on debt versus just spend your cash. It, it, you know, and debt increases money supply. It's more money in the, in the economy, more thing, more is working. Um, yeah. And so they want you to do that. And, and that's a, you know, you can, anyway, I'm, I'm just, it just frustrates me at the idea of something is good or evil. Well, why is that the law? Mm-hmm. The law says, no, it's, 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 and if the law needs to change, yeah. fair enough, but make sure you under before you try to change a law, understand what the law is trying to accomplish to, to, to begin with. And mm-hmm. the simplest framework that I can explain to a student or anyone is a system of incentives and disincentives, which is why um, when there are certain things that don't make sense, the things that don't work are the things that do the opposite of what they of, of what they're purported to do. An example would be income tax. That's the most asinine thing I've ever heard of in my life. Because if you want to, if you want to discourage something, you would tax it. You want to tax, but you want to discourage things, raise the price of, of those things. You want oh, yeah. to discourage speeding, make the tickets more expensive, make it a felony. Make, you see what I'm saying? Like you make it more expensive to do those things. You make it hurt worse and you make it, um, you make it more valuable and more advantageous to do the things that you want more yeah. of. Right. Um, yeah, that, that, that shocks me. You know, the, yeah, the, the black and white of it is, is judged through a moral lens before we even understand the way that something was put together or what the cost of it is. You know, we, we love to judge things, and I forget who said this, so this is not, a, not my, by any means my original thought, but we love to judge things by their intentions rather than by their actual outcomes. Exactly. Right. Judge policy by what it's going to do. And we don't ever, you know, anytime there's a, there's a tragedy or somebody gets hurt or something bad happens, whether it be business or personal life or, you know, in a, in a social group or to a social group or economic group or ethnic group, any group that anything, anything bad that ever happens, it's always something needs to change. Mm-hmm. It's never, oh, yeah. I mean, no, it, it, we automatically have to do something. Oh, we need to do something about this. Well, first of all, first of all, let me put on my statistician hat for a second. Um, There's 330 million people in this country. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. And over the course of a year, there's going to be bad things happen somewhere to someone all the time. It does not matter what the law is. There will be a certain amount of people. One in 50 people are bat crap crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are one in 50 people are your, your, there's nothing you're going to do about it. They're, they're absolutely, they, they, it, it, it's, it's bad. And I'm not saying that you can't love them. I'm not saying you can't do your best for them, but you know, there is, there's bad things that are going to happen somewhere, no matter what the law is. And this mm-hmm. idea of every time something bad happens, we got to change something, got to change the law, change whatever. It's crazy uh, because we never talk about how are we executing on the, on the laws we already have. Exactly. Right. And uh, man, within our industry, uh, every just wait till we get a bunch of regional banking laws. Oh my god! Yeah, you know, we had two or three or four of them that were honestly just mismanaged. Yeah, in, in in a way that if the the risk managers had taken either of our classes, they wouldn't have done what they did. So you know, are you going to let? Basically, you're trying to legislate stupidity. Yeah, and you can't do that. People are going to people are going to do dumb things. People are going um, to do dumb things and there should be consequences for those dumb things. So they have the, opportunity. no, 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 you can't have consequences. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's, that's what they're trying to do is make sure that, you know, there are no consequences when you do something stupid. And if there are no consequences, if you do something stupid, you get to keep doing stupid, st- stupid stuff. 
Yeah, it's like government because the the mm-hmm. the, the cure is always more money. It's it's always more funds. It doesn't matter what the problem is. The solution is always the government needs more. A government money. program. Yes, another no, government you know, program, and government needs more money to do it. And there's not enough money, and it doesn't. You can throw money at it, throw money at it, throw money at it, and see no improvement. And then the solution is still going to be throw more money at the problem mm-hmm. because so we remember, what, remember what intentions. You know, remember what Reagan said about uh, the government. The worst thing that somebody can do is say, I'm here from the government and I'm he- here to help. help. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Is your is your personal regulator sitting in the room with you right now? Because I, I do have somebody that follows me around all day. I now do have my own personal regulator. It doesn't surprise me. I'm not quite I'm not quite at your level there yet, Russell. Yeah. Something I, I aspire to be. But yeah, <laughs> I think that's um, you know, the it's it's going to be interesting when when some of these folks get in the workforce. And the answer is not black and white and you're asked to come to an answer. And then the answer is, well, where do I get the answer? And mm-hmm. it scares me too when we think about um, artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence in a, in a, in a, in a like your chat GP and things like this. First mm-hmm. off, um, none of us know how much students are using this stuff because only the dummies get caught. I mean, I, let me just say that again. And, I'm, and if it hurts mm-hmm. me feelings, well, grow up. Um, only the dummies get caught because yeah. it, it's not that hard to get around this stuff. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have turn it in and turn it in has a, it's this uh, web app function that universities have. Um, you know, it has this feature that tells you the likelihood of how it was, whether it was generated by AI or something, but man, there's also tools that you can pull something out, drop it into something else. that will re- redo that. And then mm-hmm. you're all at the student level. If you spend another few minutes, you can personalize it yet again with your own, own words. And so, you know, we can we can get to so much of um, so much of just the answer. But are you going to be able to derive this outside of the business and without just Googling it? And which is one of the reasons I make my students do a lot of things orally, because I tell them is, listen, it doesn't necessarily matter what you know. If you can't talk to people and you can't have a conversation and make them feel like you are credible, not because your slide is credible and your slide looks well researched, but do they trust you and your presentation? Do you sound credible? Mm-hmm. And can you address a question besides just here's what I prepared to say, right? And here's oh, yeah. the final yeah. answer. And what if I have another, how do I get to that? And that's what scares me about these. Because I think AI in the hands of the right folks is just going to make them the superstars. The best will get better because they have AI working for them. Exactly. You know, on my team. It's some, it's, it's like, it's like more people working for me, but if you are using AI to do your work, then you're not understanding your work. And no, not at all. you're not going to be able to communicate. And, and ultimately, eventually, you're going to have to communicate and people are going to have to trust that you are credible and you're not just an extension of uh, a Googler or a gpt or. Oh yeah, and I I, I love the uh, I love how you put uh, be able to explain things. Have you um when when you're uh, at Baylor, have you ever been involved with a CFA Challenge team? No. Okay, a CFA Challenge, which is is wonderful. I've been the coach at three different schools now. Yeah. Never won a championship though, so you, you you can see why I keep coaching at different schools, I guess. But um, the CFA Challenge, you get a team of three to five students together. They put together over Christmas break something that looks like a uh, a Wall Street type report, a uh, nice in depth fifteen to twenty page uh, report uh, covering all aspects of a company. I can't even remember the company we did this year right now, uh, but um, my team uh, did very well on the report. And then that's half the that's half the score. And then you go in and you make a presentation about your report. And then they start throwing, and then three investment professionals start throwing questions at you like, um, well, how did you come up? Why did you decide to use cash flow instead of PE ratio? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? I did my very best to prepare them for those why questions, but um, they all, every team that I've ever coached, and maybe this is on the coach, not as much as on the students, they tend to, um, 
not do a very good job on that part of it. And I probably need to do a better job of, of preparing them for that. But I think that's, that's very common. I mean, that, that's that's pretty, a, I think it's pretty common. That, that's an upper level question too. And, and, and I would say it that is. It top, is. that's a type of question on something like a CFA material where you're, you're really testing who gets it. And when you say who prepared, well, that is saying I'm trying, I'm trying with that question, I'm trying to see who is a B plus and who's an A plus because yeah. there's so much overlap in the, in those sorts of things. So I think that there, that, that opportunity will always be there. And, you know, man, you know what grades are now. It's like, everybody's, you know, like you, you you're, you're, you got to really justify it if you're given anything lower than a B. Yep. You got to justify giving a B and it's going to be problems, right? Because these kids, you know, anyway, I want to get into, get into, I, ma I managed to have zero grade complaints after this most recent semester. Uh, and it's not, and it's not because of grade inflation. Yeah. It's well, because I'm very straightforward up front. I, I don't, uh, I, guess I, I, I think I've, I've had incredible students, you know, um, some have, like I said, have been surprisingly prepared and surprisingly bright and, um, you know, students that could, that could be incredible anywhere. But I do have the concern that a lot of things are just checking the box information. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that the information that they're leaving my classroom with is going to be that valuable to um, me and the workforce mm -hmm. versus the skills and the ability to think and be able to go find the answers um, one of the things that, that scared me is the amount of students that um, just don't want to read anything and um, oh they're going to complain if there's anything on a test that wasn't covered in a lecture. And you can flat out say this reading is going to be on the exam. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about some of the some of some really key points. But we're not going to talk about everything. You're going to need to do the reading. And still, yeah. you know, well, that wasn't in the lecture. Well, that the lecture is not the only thing that, that you have to do to, to be successful in this class, mm -hmm. right? And it's not just listing. And they, there's a lot of students I've known, especially at the undergrad level, that just want things to be listing. They want, <laughs> I, know, I want to know what I have to memorize, what I have to mm -hmm. memorize. And when it comes to understanding, applying, I mean, even, even multiple choice questions. If it's not fill in the blank, like, you know, if it was to be something like, you know, um, if I was trying to hedge my blah, 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 which trade would I make? Okay, well, that's just a very definition type thing. You either know what a protective put is or not, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But if it's actually something that actually requires you to think through the answers, and depending on the route you go, different ones could be correct, whether you take the right mental steps, mm -hmm. those, they get mad. And again, oh, not, yeah. not no, everyone. I but it is there is a, a big aversion to thinking that scares me when it when it thinks and I don't really know you know when I, when I, so it's, it's it's challenged me to think how and I and I don't interview a lot of folks that are that are that young um, so usually when I'm interviewing people who've already got some work experience or got something to go off of but if I was interviewing someone um, coming right out of an MBA right out of undergrad you know the the school they went to doesn't matter as much to me as it used to. I hate mm -hmm. to say that, but if I don't know what skills I'm getting, you know, you don't, you just um, don't even care. What do, you, I, what do you ask? Yeah. I had a kid write a note on one of his homeworks this past semester saying, um, you didn't cover, you didn't get to this in class. So I don't know how to answer it. Do you have a book? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, so I, I didn't get to it. You don't know how to answer it. I, you got a book, at least give it a shot. Yeah. It's kind of funny because what I had decided to do I, was, well, I didn't get to it. If they answer it, great. If they don't answer it, I won't count it off. But I counted off when they said, you didn't get to it, so I can't answer it. Here, here's it's no that, effort. Here's the, the thing that I think that this, this, that, that, that this universities are the worst at. And I think it's because we're making, or maybe not the worst, but I think it's because we continue to do what people ask for to make them happy because we're, you know, this is, this is big money game, right? Yeah. You know, we throw all this money into education. Anyone can get a loan for anything. So you got to make them happy, right? So because, because if they don't go to your resort, they're going to go to someone else's resort. 
Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these colleges are freaking resorts. And you can complain about the cost, but it's expensive to give you this incredible experience that you're getting mm -hmm. um, is self self teaching. And I yeah. listen, yeah. I get it. I love great professors and I take pride in trying to be interesting and be energetic and be enthusiastic. I take pride in trying to be those things because I know it's easier to learn and I want to motivate people to learn. I think it's part of my job to motivate people to learn and make it interesting. Um, make it applicable, right? Not everything theoretical. Mm -hmm. But I also think that in the work world, I would much rather have a student, a worker who is excellent at teaching themselves things than excellent at listening to lectures and applying what they learned in a lecture. I want people who are able to teach them things themselves or they're given, you know, 10 minutes with me and then they go do two hours of work and they come back and they've, they, they filled in the blanks. It's not, wow. well, you didn't tell me that. Well, of course I didn't because I'm the CEO and I'm not going to spend four hours a day with you doing your job. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to, to give you 10 minutes of coaching here and then a half hour here and then 10 minutes here and you need to go self learn and I'm not going to check all of your work. Right. Right. Um, it's, I'm not going to hold your hand through all of this. And that just, that's the thing that probably scares me the most is self-learning is a dirty word. And in the real world, it's way more important to me. It's, you can learn what, yourself than what, than what I can teach you. It, you, know, you say self-learning and I just keep thinking, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and that's what you, you employ people. Uh, I, I, early on at a hedge fund, I, I remember, you know, my, my boss talking to me about, uh, basically all he's employing me for is my ability, you know, is my cognitive abilities and that's it. And he didn't want me do basically what he didn't want me doing was, um, it was a small place and sometimes I'd make copies. I, you know, I'm just one of those wipe my own butt person people. Yeah. And he said, look, you're supposed, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be, you know, figure out uh, new ways that, you know, where we think uh, there are inefficiencies in the market and how can we take advantage of those? You don't need to be, um, you know, unloading the dishwasher in the, in the kitchen at work and think, but, you know, or any of that stuff. Whereas I was like, you know, I, I'm more than happy to, to take care of myself, but it was. I, like, I agree a hundred percent. And the, the, the thing is, is like the, one of the things that I'm that I think I'm probably best at is helping other people get the best out of themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I I love coaching. I love being a cheerleader. I I one of the best compliments I've I've, I've gotten in a while is I was at this thing this past Monday night uh, for a friend of mine from college, very successful guy. Um, he's got, a, he's got a fund that he's working on that has a social impact, um, type of, type of, of element to it. And, um, and, uh, I was talking, I met his wife for the first time and she said to me, she's like, man, you really are just like a champion for people. Aren't you? He's like, you know, you just, and I was like, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Really? I, I, he yeah. is kicking, he's kicking ass. I love to see it. There's another guy that there I knew that he's kicking. I'm, I, I just, I love to see people that are around me do well. I like to be around successful people. Being around mm -hmm. successful people and having successful friends is motivating to me because I want to be around people that I got to keep up with, right? Yeah. I want to be around people that are that are going to the next level. And I don't want to push people down. I don't, don't want to be mad at people being successful. I want to be happy people who are successful, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, why did I get off on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just t talking about you, you, you also probably want to support people that are able to figure things out on their own. Yeah, I, I think that I, I do think that's where you were kind of going with that. Maybe so. I got, got off on a little yeah. bit of a tangent there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I want people to to go do it themselves. I want them to figure it out. I want to help coach people. I want to be coached. I want to mm -hmm. I want uh, feedback if I can do things better. Um but the do it yourself sort of thing does seem to be something that's getting harder and harder to to find. We kind of want instant success. We feel like we're kind of owed success. I was, okay, here's what I was going to say is I think that the people that that is I was very self sufficient, 
right? And I did everything myself and it was some good coaching to me at a point in my career saying, why are you doing that? Like, well, yeah. because it needs to be done. Well, shouldn't you, well, it would cost money to have somebody else do that. Yes, but it would cost X dollars and your time is worth X plus 50. So this is a bad investment that you're spending your time doing this. And that's the that's, that's the coaching mm-hmm. I needed to hear at a certain point in my career. But at the same time, because that was true of me at a, at a point in my career, that doesn't mean that was true of me day one of my career. Mm-hmm. Day one of my career was you need to do this yourself. Why? Because uh, your, your time is worth X and somebody else's time to do this for you is worth X plus five. You shouldn't be hiring this because your time is worth yeah. less than the person that you're actually hiring to do it. You need to just work another hour and do this. Right. But yeah. uh, but we, we're, we're, we we tend to skip those levels and want to go, you know, you need to hear it. You need to hear it. Russell, do what you're paid to do. Do what you're uniquely qualified to do because you do something special. Mm-hmm. But that's not so for everyone at every level. And that's OK. You can get to a level where you need to specialize and spend more of your time doing a certain thing. But there's but people need to hear that early in your career and not just early in your career, but until you've been successful at something, whether it's early or late, you're going to need to learn to do things yourself and figure it out yourself. Because this attitude of no one's taught me. Why should everybody care? Why, why are we entitled to somebody else's time and expertise that they've put years into something, building something Um and building an expertise into something that we, we expect them to just give it to us. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a, there's a great story of a guy in Chicago, a pretty successful trader back in the day. And he lived in one of, uh, you know, lived in the gold coast, which uh, used to be a nice neighborhood. And he, um, he's riding up the elevator. It's like he split a floor with a guy that was some sort of you know brain surgeon or something. And one morning, uh, the, he's riding on the elevator with the brain surgeon guy. And the guy says, you know, um, if you've got some time this weekend, I would love for you to teach me, um, you know, about trading. And the, and I, I doubt this really happened, but it's a great story. And the trader said, well, you know, and after that, maybe you can teach me brain surgery. <laughs> you know, it, it's like I've spent, yeah, I've, I've spent 25, uh, well, heck, 30 years now, uh, really in the industry, I guess, 30 years now. And there's just institutional knowledge things that I, I don't, I can try really hard to pass on, but uh, are not, you know, just, it's just not fully teachable. And it's stuff that I picked up on my own. You know, I continue to pick things up on my own. I, yeah. I don't, uh, I try to, uh, and we didn't get to it right out of time, but we were going to bad mouth people that do guru stuff on TikTok and et cetera. Um, I we got, we got time for that next week. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get, get, next get week. on that one next week. But, um, you know, I, it, I, I, I never, um, I try to avoid listening to, to people like that. Cause I don't want them to get in my head. I want, I want to, if I'm thinking about something and, you know, thinking about trading one market against the other, uh, I want to come at it with a completely clean slate and, and not be anchored by other people's thoughts or, uh, what people are saying out in the media as well. So, uh, you know, I, I, and, and I, I think if there were somebody that's just out of college, um, and, and, you know, I said, uh, I, I said, you know, how should we approach the Asian markets? They're just going to go look at a bunch of other people's opinions yeah, and, and regurgitate those. Um, whereas I'm, you know, reading about, you know, I, I'm paying attention to the folks that, uh, debunk the numbers that China puts out all the time. Yeah. You know, like, it, cause they're. Uh, there's not a whole lot of credibility behind um, data that comes out of the Chinese government. And I have a really hard time believing that their GDP recently grew about 5% when, when it's not showing up anywhere else, you know, and, and coming up with that disconnect, that's, you know, investments of competition. If the generation behind us can't put two and two together like that, I'm fine with that. That's more money for me. (laughs) <laughs> well, there'll always be a remnant of exceptional ones. And I, and I've yeah. definitely seen, seen that uh, to be the case. It's the, it's the rank and file or the middle of the road or oh, the, there's uh, they, they, the, the, the just go to, co- the, the, to me, the ones that get it. And then uh-huh. of course this is true. Everybody wants to get it. The ones that get it, always get it. 
but the ones that get that they're going to to here to get skills that employers desire and they mm -hmm. listen enough to hear, hey, the thinking is really what we need because I can really enhance with a robot what you're doing and a lot of things you're doing I could do myself. But I need you to think because the more you interact with me that's not coaching to the next level, when I'm coaching to, to your current level, you're not helping. Mm -hmm. Because I don't need to teach you to, 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 to the base, basic thinking skills, which and this is the reason a lot of more companies are starting to spurn the education because they're seeing that they've got to train them anyway, because you're not coming to the world with the skills that we actually need. So why, why even value a college degree if, if getting a college degree doesn't tell me that you've got the skills that you need? No, it, I mean, there, there's a lot more to it. And that's why, I mean, heck, that's why we interview people. That's why we... Um, you know, that's, that's why I give them little tests if I'm thinking about having them work with me. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what, what do you bring to the table other than being able to do things that I directly tell you to do? Well, sometimes, sometimes Russell changing gears here is all it really takes is the right family. Um, you know, yeah. uh, the house oversight committee just revealed this week that nine Biden family members received wire transfers from foreign nationals via get this shell companies and, and what does a shell company exactly do <laughs> they, they they get Wait. you away from it's it's a it's a level of basically mm. hiding something right and, and, and I, maybe, maybe i'm not the best, maybe i'm not the best way to say that to me it's basically saying it's a company that's separated from the actual actor to give a level of separation and so it takes a lot more work to really figure out like who actually owns this entity. And yeah. when you domicile these things in different countries with different rules, and you know, even 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 there are certain states in the United States, like for example, I, I believe it's Wyoming that it's pretty easy to hide who actually owns it. Um, and then you get, you know, the the what is it, uh, the Caymans and places like that. And there's all these mm -hmm. places you can put companies as well. But anyway, shell companies basically just kind of creating levels of separation. You got to do more and more homework to find it. But this wasn't just the hunter. This was Hunter's. Oh, it's 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 ex girlfriend, his ex wife, his current wife, yeah. basically anyone who 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 Hunter Biden has has slept with, um, and right. his uh, Biden's you know, grandkids, grandchildren, grandchildren. I don't think I don't think the grand, I don't think the grandkid in in Arkansas has a shell company. Yeah, you know which one? The one they don't. The, the you know the one that um, a. Uh, that Hunter fathered with a dancer down in Little Rock. Uh, that that one we don't ever talk about. I doubt they have a shell company. Probably uh, doubt they're taking care of it all, actually. <laughs> but you know the, the 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 thing that that irks me a bit, and and this goes well beyond um, you know the Biden family. You know the the idea, and and I've done this. I was elected to an office. I served my four years, and I got out. Um, we're supposed to be a representative type government. That's that's how we were created. We weren't supposed yeah. to have lifelong people. Like Joe Biden has really the only job he's ever had is uh, being elected to a variety of things. OK, I, I got I have a fact uh, for, for you if you haven't heard this one. Uh, uh -uh. Uh, you know what? I interrupted you. You finish your thought, please. please. Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, it, it my, you know, at least, you know, um, I, when Trump got elected. And I, I really try to see the best in every situation. And when Trump got elected, I was like, cool. Maybe people with managerial type skills, with business skills, instead of life law of government skills, will, you know, start to maybe take a look at uh, trying to help in government. You know, uh, we've got a guy named Oberwise here who's in, in, the, in the Illinois area who keeps running for stuff and never gets elected. But he runs a um, he runs an investment management firm and he runs a uh, yeah, the, he's the milkman. If you if you have milk delivered to your house, Oberwise is the one that brings it to you. They got great ice cream shops as well. But the point is, he's got a business background and wanted to do some government service. Um, I don't think if all you've ever done is get elected to House or elected to the Senate, and that's your whole career, um, that it I, I feel like you're getting more out of it than you're putting in anymore. Yeah. And you know, represent being a representative uh, or a work. Being in government, I think it's you know it, it it's should be more of a rotational thing than a lifelong career. As much as I hate to say this, and I hate 
to say this. I hate to say this because as you know, I grew up very modestly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me to say this hurts, but it makes me a little scared when someone has not accomplished anything in the real world and then goes into government. Here's why. Because in order to stay in government, you have to spend a lot of time raising money. And if you're spending 70% of your time raising money, which a lot of them are, like literally, um, then who are you raising money from? Well, people you're going to have to keep happy. People you're going to have to keep happy in order to continue getting elected. So you're not really working for the people. You're working to get reelected. Uh -huh. And, you know, I hate to say this, but... It really, really bothers me when someone hasn't accomplished something. And it, and it doesn't mean that they need to come from a rich family or that they, need, that they need to be a billionaire or a millionaire many times over. But I feel like you should have accomplished something in the real world to show some credibility, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. to, you know, to do this. And it hurts me to say that because I didn't come for money. And, it, you know, it's... Uh, if I was to run for something, I'd have to raise raise a bunch of money. And how how do you keep your values when you ultimately have to make sure you keep certain people happy in order to keep having money to run? And well, when you do that forever, I mean, you're you've been doing that a long time. This is what you do. What you do is you you're owned. You're owned at that point. They're all owned. And the longer you, you know, so if someone wants to do it for one or two terms it's possible to do something for one or two terms and not be owned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if but, you're going to do something for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you are owned. You're yeah, owned. And your, your job is getting reelected. Your job is getting reelected. That's re your job. It's That's in my, uh, my daughter, who's, who's interested in politics, there was like a state rep that came and spoke to the political club at her high school. And the guy um, afterwards, he was like, could you all – post on my social media what, how great it was to meet me, uh, blah, 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 blah. It, it, and everything in his follow-up was to help him. Yeah. And she said, what? what and, and she she kind of internally, between the two of us, she called it out. She said, I, I, I don't, you know, he, he's not doing anything for us. And I said, honey, his job is to get reelected. Yeah. He would not have come and spent time with you guys uh, I'll tell you this, honey, because it was this school year when she's a senior and she's 18 and can vote now. I said, I'll guarantee he would not come and talk to a freshman class. Yeah. You know, but he'll come and talk to a group of 18 year olds to get to vote for the first time and and who are somewhat impressionable. I'm like, well, I met that guy. I'm going to vote for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel like she's gotten some some uh, reality hits with things like that. Yeah. Uh, when she was when she was looking at colleges, she went to a career fair or like a college fair, and she really hit it off with one of the people at um, a school that I knew she wouldn't like. I knew it, but she really liked the recruiter. And then we went on the tour, and about a third of the way through the tour, she said, "This place is a dump." And I was like, "Yeah, I know, honey." And and you know, I said, "She said, let's leave." And I said, "Nope, we're here. We're going to finish the thing out. We'll talk about it in the car." And it was like an hour, hour and a half drive home. And, you know, I just said, look, you know, the, the, the person that recruited you to come here, her job is to get you on campus yep. and, you know, they will, and she's going to say anything to get you on campus. And she did. And she just, uh, she, she was really bitter about that, but I think it's good that she's learning those lessons Absolutely. ahead, ahead That's of time. A good lesson. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good, it's good, good, good lesson. Uh, Absolutely. what I was going to tell you before I so really interrupted you and had to backtrack and, uh, ask you to finish. Um, something that I learned that I thought was pretty funny is Joe Biden, his birth date is closer to the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln than it is to his own inauguration. Oh my God. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> the date of birth is closer to, wow. That's Abe fantastic. Lincoln's. I love it inauguration than it is his own inauguration. That's fantastic. Guy's going to be 130 by the time he's, he's out of office. 
And with that, I think we've wrapped up another uh, episode, Russell. Uh, everyone that's joined us, thank you so much for your time today. Please give us a like, comment, share us. Uh, share us with your network, share us with your friends. We appreciate that. And we thank you so much for being a part of uh, the show with us today. 